Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, joining the virtual Tocqueville Breakfast. My name is Mike Kehoe. Yen Yi Kehoe. And we're chairs of the Tocqueville Society. We're very excited to have you with us today. And we're excited to hear from our incredible panel of uh, community advisors and business leaders who are working to help support the city do, during these difficult times. Um, we're also excited to kick off our cor Corporate Partnership Summit. And we're joined to, joining today through Zoom, through the chat function, which if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see an opportunity to submit questions. We'll do the best to, uh, to answer those questions as time permits throughout the morning. <coughs> Next, I'd like to thank our sponsors, KPMG, Davis Graham and Stubbs, Kaiser Permanente, and PCL Construction. Thank you for all that support. Now more than ever, we're incredibly grateful for these partnerships. We love working with our corporate partners and each of the Tocqueville Society members. We'd also like to thank each of the incredible award winners of our annual Community Champions Award. The Community Champions will be honored at the end of the initial meeting around 9 o'clock, so please join if you can. Each year, these companies have gone above and beyond in their efforts towards employee engagement, corporate social responsibility, and community investments. Thanks to each of these incredible partners and all the work they do in supporting Mile High United Way in our community. We're grateful to be a part of Mile High United Way, to be part of supporting families who may have lost their jobs, may be at risk of losing their homes, may be struggling to support their children as they've been facing the challenges that we're experiencing, including uh, online schooling for their children. All these people are hardworking individuals in need of the resources that Mile High United Way provides. You may often hear that Mile High United Way works in great partnership with the communities. That couldn't be more true than today. We're often asked how can we support uh, things like child care centers who are at risk of closure, providing laptops and internet service to people that need to connect and don't necessarily have access, people that need rental assistance in order to stay in their rental homes, and food to support the hardworking farmers who may have lost a job. We're grateful to be a part of this impact in our community, and we know that we still have a long way to go. Leading us on that journey is Christine Bonero. Christine? Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Young He, and welcome to all of our Tocqueville members um, this morning. Um, Mike and, oh, I am, there we go. The, the power of Zoom. I'm going to learn how to do this right. At least I wasn't muted. Good morning to everybody. And Mike and, and Young He, thank you so much for your leadership. Always are you beside us when we need you the most in the last five months when it has become so challenging for our community and we've needed to think so differently of how we engage um, in these conversations and how we engage our Tocqueville members. You, you both have been by our side, um, inspiring us, uh, challenging us, making us stay connected and I just can't thank you both enough for your um, your leadership and to all of our um, Tocqueville members this morning and guests who are joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for what is such an incredibly important um, conversation of what's happening in our community and the incredible business leaders that are leading us right now. I am Christine Bonero and I have the pleasure and truly the honor of serving as president and, and CEO of Mile High United Way. And as Mike and Young he said this morning, we are really in very unprecedented times that we have never um, seen before. Certainly at the Mile High United Way, we're seeing it firsthand as um, our calls and outreach through our 211 Help Center continue to just go um, through the roof. The desire of the small businesses and the support that our small business community has been needing and asking for through our Small Business Alliance, the young people we are privileged to serve in bridging the gap and making sure they are staying connected to the mental health services and the housing that they so desperately need. Again, the entire community changed before our eyes. And certainly, I have never been more proud to live in the state of Colorado where we have the political leadership that we have uh, with our governor and with our mayor, who again understood the impact that he was going to, that they, that this unprecedented time was gonna have on all of us. And so they reached out to the community, um, both Governor Polis and Mayor Hancock understood that it was going to take all of us to respond and so reached out to the very best business minds to say, how do we get through this united as um, 
community. And so this morning I am, and we are all very honored to have truly some of the best of those business minds that have been leading our community through these through these times and i would love to ask all of our panelists who are joining us this morning if they would turn on their their videos because i am truly excited to introduce to all of you longtime friends of of colorado um and um for individuals that i just admire and respect and have been honored and privileged to work with over the past um past four months we were talking about um this morning. So Mayor Hancock um, appointed four months ago a committee called the Economic Relief and Recovery Council that is chaired by Lori Davis and is made up of five subcommittees, again, with some of the best business leaders in, in the community. And we are so proud this morning to have three of those co-chairs join us this morning longtime friend, friend of my heart, Leadership Denver a class together, we won't tell them when, um, Denise, but Denise Burgess is here with us this morning, the president and CEO of Burgess Services and the co-chair of the Small and Medium Business Committee of uh, the Economic Relief and Recovery Council. We are also so honored to um, be joined by her um, co-chair, Andrew Feinstein, who is, is also the co-chair of the Small and Medium Business Committee of the ERRC, as we call it, and the CEO and managing partner of Exto um, Development. And to watch, Andy, what has been happening um, and your leadership has been just, um, just extraordinary. Again, we as women know that it is our women um, friends and colleagues and friends of the heart that hold us up. And like Denise, I am so pleased to welcome um, longtime friend um, Janice Sinden, who is the co-chair of the Restaurant and Entertainment Arts, Culture and Hospitality Committee, the, the REACH um, Committee, and the president and CEO of truly the cultural jewel of, of Denver, the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. And then certainly last but but not least, um, the reason that I am actually sitting here um, this morning, former chairman of the board of the Mile High um, United Way, um, the man that hired me for, um, for this uh, position, who, when the governor needed to call, again, the best of our, our state, called Noel Ginsburg um, to lead the, the um, COVID response um, for the state of Colorado, the chairman of Intertech Plastics, and what is truly changing, I believe, not just the state of Colorado for young people, but really the country, the founder and uh, the chairman of CareerWise, um, Noel Ginsburg. So I can't begin to thank all of you enough for um, joining us the, this morning. And again, for all of our colleagues watching online, please feel free to type a question in the, in the chat and um, because you have the leaders that are helping, as I said, lead us through. So um, with that, I think I'm gonna just um, jump in. And um, Denise, if I think if it's all right, I'm going to start with, with you um, sure. this morning. And um, you are a small, you're a former um, chairman of the board of the Denver Metro Chamber, but, but you are a small business um, uh, leader. And what has been the impact? What is happening within our small business community um, right now? And what are you seeing within the ERRC? Um, well, thank you for being here. It's an honor to, to be asked and to be here. Um, the small business community has been impacted negatively. I mean, unfortunately, they have um, not been able to all open. They've not, they've lost 60 to 80% of their income. They are trying to figure out what's next. Uh, the majority are not um, online. Um, they're used to having bricks and mortar, whether you're commercial or retail. Uh, they're trying to figure out what to do with employees to retain employees as best they can. And as everyone knows, they were not the majority recipients of a lot of the PP loan money from the federal government that was a complicated for a lot of small businesses 
if you didn't have a support staff or support system, it was very difficult for them to attain um, any kind of loan situation. Um, the other part of it is, in is trying to pivot and trying to figure out how best to survive and maintain and adjust to the new normal with not only employees, but the stress of it all, uh, maintaining a business, having your employees stay in place. Um, so it's been a real challenging time for small business. And that's the negative side of it. The other part of it is, is as entrepreneurs, we have to think new. We have to think out of the box. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on, which is nice to see, especially in ERC council and Andy and I co-chair, but also with people I talk to that they're kind of like, you know what, it forced me to go online and I've doubled my business. I've had a couple of those. Um, they'd never done it before. They never even thought about it. Um, there was a Western tackle shop that said, finally said, you know, I made the most money I did going online. So it was just kind of, a, those, those, are the, those are the stories also that are out there. So it's been an interesting time, a challenging time, but I also think it allows business people to once again think of a new way to do things. Denise, thank you. And I'm going to ask all of our panelists at the end of, of what should we be doing as, as community members and what should we be thinking about um, differently. So Andy, I know you've been co-chairing um, with, with Denise. What has, what has been, and you are clearly um, one of the lead business owners in, in Rhino, what are you seeing from, from your perspective? And um, tell us a little bit about your committee in particular, particular and what you and Denise have been, have been working on. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Christine, for having me on board. You know, United Way is our neighbor. You're right around the corner, and a lot of your members may not know this, but my ancestors, when they came to Denver in 1870, had a general store at 24th and Stout, so literally, like, across the street from your headquarters. So United Way has always had a special place and uh, in our hearts here in Rhino, and you've always been a great neighbor and community leader, so thank you. Um, it's been an honor to do this work alongside Denise Burgess. Denise really... I already mentioned a few of the things that we've been working on, just uh, uh, really trying to assist small businesses in every way possible. Um, she's being a little modest because Denise spearheaded something that I think our committee is incredibly proud of, and that is the um, distribution of, how many, Denise, how many PPE kits? 4,500. 4,500 PPE kits to small businesses. These PPE kits are worth hundreds of dollars each. And because of Denise's advocacy uh, and her passion for this, um, and Noel, I believe we collaborated with the state on this to get this done. So Noel, Noel really gave us a, a huge assist. I'm going to use a basketball term, a huge assist to get these PPE kits out. So that's just been an incredible, incredible program. So we're proud of that. Um, just anything you can think of for small businesses. We collaborated very closely with Janice and Walter's team on the, what we call the REACH Committee, which is like restaurants and hospitalities to spearhead the uh, outdoor patio expansion, which we believe is a game changer. It's the only opportunity that most of these bars and restaurants, including my own at Trax, has to survive, uh, at least make a little bit of revenue. Uh, what we're saying in the hospitality business is it's a way to lose less money, um, but no one's making money right now, but at least it's giving everyone a lifeline. So we're really proud of that initiative. Uh, and we've done some things that are kind of off the radar or under the radar, I should say, that we're proud of. We did a town hall with gyms. We've done it, we, Denise, Denise has uh, spearheaded a whole program with minority women and, and micro businesses that kind of slipped through the cracks. Um, and I know just with gyms themselves, they didn't know that they could have outdoor workouts and things like that. So we lobbied the parks department to make sure that gyms could get permits to work out outdoors. So just any little thing we could think of to support small businesses, we've, been, we've just been trying to do it. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's uh, there's not a panacea answer to solve the issues that small business is going through, but um, and I'm sorry, I'm rambling, but one more I thought of Denise and I worked on is making sure that small businesses have access to financial information so they know how to apply for programs and grants and PPP money. We got to be careful. We talk about PPP and PPE a lot in our calls. Um, so just anything and everything we can do for small businesses. I am a small business owner, so I've had a front row seat. And as my position as chairperson of Rhino, I've also had a front row seat to what small businesses are going through. And this is a unique uh, recession situation because I've never been involved in this. This is my third recession in my professional life. I've never seen one where every single business is adversely affected. No one is spared. 
Um, and the bad joke that Janice and I share is I never thought that throwing a party for a thousand people would be a bad business model. So um, we're all dealing with this in different ways, but um, uh, I hope that answers the question somewhat. No, Andy, it, it's great. Thank you. And again, listening to, to, your, vo to your voice and Denise's voice, because Denver and, and the metro area is an economy of small business, um, all in all. So um, for Andy and Denise, what has been the biggest surprise of working in partnership, um, either with the city or just in this new world that we're, that we're all living in? Um, the resilience of people, I think, the sense of hope. Uh, I said all those negative things, but the true sense of hope among small business owners is still there. Um, and their belief that we'll come out of it. Um, I mean, they truly believe we'll, we'll get on the other side of this. So that's been, for me personally, that's been my um biggest sort of oh okay when i'm thinking negative then i just start to talk to small business and i get in a better mood um i would just comment i want to comment really positively on the city you asked about what our partnership with the city's been like um you know i take the position that in wartime it's which i think this is it's time to be innovative and move quickly and um, i think we owe mayor michael hancock and his cabinet a lot of credit because there was a lot of trepidation about expediting some of the things that uh, Janice, Denise, and myself have been advocating for, and they've done it. I mean, they, no one moves as fast as I want them to move, but that's just because I'm impatient. But, you know, we have 300 restaurants right now that have expanded their premises either into sidewalks, parking lots, parking lets, or roads. And to think about that, to get that done in a couple months time is remarkable. I think we have the most approval, most approved expanded restaurant uh, premises of any sit major city in the, in the United States. Um, you know, really, really pushing hard on the city and they've responded. They want to be innovative. They recognize that this is a dire circumstance and they've got to move quickly. So I think that's been a really healthy partnership. Again, that comes from the mayor's uh, leadership. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, just to you know, re, re, uh, uh, reinforce what Denise just said, the resiliency of small business, they want to be creative. They want to innovate. They just want to know what the rules are. So I guess that's been a little bit of a frustration is, you know, the governor keeps kind of moving the goalposts on us as a, as a business community. Um, but once they know what the rules are, the resiliency and the creativity is, is really remarkable. It's been fun to watch. Silver lining. There are, there are some silver, silver linings. So Janice, you bring such a unique perspective to, to all of this all of this work, um, certainly as the past um, CEO of Colorado Concern, leading the business community, then, then the mayor's chief of staff, and now again leading um, probably also one of the hardest hit parts of our, of our community, which are, are our cultural um, institutions. So talk to us a little bit about what's happening in, in your world, and then a little bit about your work as well. Thanks, Christine. And I also want to acknowledge um, Christine's important leadership on the EERC with Fran Campbell, the president of the Asian Chamber. She's leading strategic partners, which of course is no surprise because there's no one that's more strategic when it comes to partnerships than Christine and her lens and making sure that the four corners of our community are included, never overlooked, always stood up, um, is just incredibly important to the work of all of the ERRC committees. And and again, I'd just like to extend my sincere gratitude to Andy and Denise for the partnership we've had over the last four months. It has been, um, you know, um, backbreaking, but um, uplifting work. And so I just, uh, I'm so grateful. Um, you know, the arts and culture community has a, a long road to hoe here. Um, we will be probably about the last to reopen. Um, the Denver Center in particular, um, you know, we have eight theaters that we occupy on the arts complex and until there's a vaccine you know there really isn't a lot of opportunity for us to keep our folks employed and to continue to produce art so um, what we've really tried to do with our committee was figure out the arts organizations that we actually can support and make sure that they're um, as open ready and viable as possible a couple of things that we've worked on um, you know we uh, hosted eight town hall meetings with very various uh, sectors, whether it was small arts organizations, large arts organizations, 
band planners, indoor venue operators. So we really got a lay of the land to understand the unique challenges facing um, our community. Um, from that, we were really able to work hand in glove with, uh, uh, with Mayor Hancock's administration to seek variances through the um, process that Governor Polis had put in place. And I feel very fortunate because I also am a member of Governor Polis's cultural committee. So we've actually been able to kind of bridge the divide between municipal government and state government to make sure that there's coordination whenever possible. And that resulted in us um, receiving a variance to open the Denver Zoo and the Denver Art Museum and the Museum of Nature and Science and the Botanic Gardens. But it took a lot of work to really figure out what we needed to do so that families and um, folks of all walks of life could come out and enjoy our arts and cultural um, institutions. Um, that is not enough though. And we know that we need to find ways that we can put the folks that are out of work and will be for an extended period of time back to work. So I think the workforce development efforts that the ERRC has also been pursuing and, um, is really important to the arts and culture sector. Um, you know, there's also some federal legislation out there that could really support the arts and culture community um, nationally. Um, we're super proud of Colorado Senator you, um, um, Michael Bennett for leading the Restart Act, which would be an extension of the CARES package. Um, we all need to stand in solidarity with him and see if he can work with, um, with congressional leadership to get that bill passed in as quickly as possible. So we have done a um, statewide uh, lobbying effort to get everybody behind the Restart Act. There's also a bill sponsored by Senators Klobuchar and Cornyn, which is called the Save Our Stages Act. And this is actually a grant program from the federal government that would not need to be repaid, that would support the live entertainment industry. And so as you think about Cleo Parker Robinson dance and Wonderbound, and you know, the list is so long of live entertainment sectors, um, they need funds in order to get through um, this unprecedented time with COVID. Um, and also this has been a really uplifting time, I would say for um, the organizations especially in the arts and culture space to come together around um, you know Black Lives Matters and the, the issues of race and justice that have also surfaced during this time. Um, our organization is grappling with it as well and taking it super serious. Never let a good crisis go to waste and take the time that you need as you're looking at your organization to figure out who we are um, and where we're going and how we can really take this opportunity to be better. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with this, you know, not in addition to helping venues figure out um, reopening guidelines and things like that, um, we have our eye on the winner. We know that um, the cold months are upon us. Andy reminds us at every possible turn that um, organizations need to figure out how to generate revenue right now so that as the cold months come upon us, we um, hopefully have given them some path forward. Um, Walter Eisenberg, who is my co-chair of the REACH Committee, concepted what he's coining the winter wonderland, really a way that we can figure out how we're supporting retail, restaurants, hospitality, arts and culture, and that our outdoor spaces are ready to receive um, our, our community and that we can celebrate being with each other, even though we may not be able to be indoors and have our traditional, um, uh, you know, kind of Thanksgiving to New Year's events. We're not going to have the Nutcracker this year. We're not going to have a Christmas carol. We're not going to have a lot of the symphony, symphony productions and whatnot. So how can we bring it to the community in a safe outdoor space? So more to come. We're just getting started, um, but really, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here today, Christine. Janice, thank you. And again, there's just no, no one more articulate and passionate. And so what is the, what has been the biggest surprise to you? Now you have walked in all three, all three sectors and in, in the corporate sector, the, the private sector, and certainly in the, in the public sector. So what has been the biggest surprise to you over the last four months? Um, it's, it's sort of a coordination. Uh, you know, I'm, thrilled that both our governor and our mayor have done such an incredible job of advocating for resources to come to our city and our state so that we can do amazing things like what Denise and Andy led with the PPE and really figuring out how we can take community development block grants and put them into the hands of workforce development leaders like Noel and, um, and working with institutions of higher ed to figure out how we can get folks trained and how we can stand communities up that um, 
um, so quickly um, would fall into the shadows. And so I think that we are, um, as you said, Christine, we are so fortunate to have the leadership that we have that push really hard and are incredibly present. Um, but I think uh, the delivery of resources and funds has been um, uh, something we should all be proud of. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So Noel, I remember so very well when all of this all of this started um, four months ago, and and the governor held his first uh, COVID briefing, which none of us even sort of knew what that meant in terms of that. And standing right behind him um, was you, um, saying, "I have called the best in the in the state to help lead us lead us forward." Um, so what is happening across the state? at the state and as, as Andy said you have played such a distinct role of not only advising the governor but your work around um, PPE and then of course I hope you'll talk a little bit about what you have been doing still career-wise um, because it becomes even more important for the young people in our our community but no we'd love to get an update from you and I think you might be on mute Noel so <laughs> it's the zoom bingo game there you um, are. Thanks, Christine. I always forget to press that button even after I all I know it. Uh, so there's really two things happening at the state. When the governor first reached out to me, it was to procure for the emergency operations center the PPE that would be needed where there would be outbreaks throughout the state. And so that was really phase one. It was putting a supply chain together. And when we were doing that for the state, I can tell you, I didn't know what an N95 or a KN95 mask was or whether or not you could make those products here in Colorado or if you'd have to go, as ultimately was the case, literally across the world to procure that product. But the first stage was really building up that inventory for the state to make sure that our healthcare providers had what they needed in order to serve the people of Colorado as the hospitals began to be impacted by this. Uh, I can say that I was impressed from the very first day, standing next to me was uh, members of the governor's staff at the Emergency Operations Center, and they were and continue to be incredible people that were literally, for some, I think, working 24 hours a day to make sure that we had this under control in the state, and the governor really, in my opinion, did a good job. I was also, you know, it's interesting when you go into the EOC, there's a wall the size of this, you know, probably a hundred feet across, just showing data about what was happening across the state from hotspots to the number of ventilators that existed to what were in use, hospital beds filled and unfilled. And it really helped all of us get an understanding of what we needed statewide. So the first part of that work was to fill up um, the state uh, coffers warehouse of that critical needed product. That being said, uh, when you ask the question, what was the difference between Colorado and Denver? Certainly in the urban centers, the hospitals were better prepared in terms of inventory for what they needed. In rural Colorado, that wasn't always the case. Some of our rural hospitals were already financially on the edge, didn't have the supply chain as sophisticated as we had at in the state. So we also opened up partnerships with an organization called Angel Flight, where we were able to get volunteer pilots to move, whether it masks or ventilators, to the farthest reaches of our state, to some of the smallest communities when they needed it. So we began to really mobilize resources to not just meet the needs within our urban centers, but across, across the state. With that being said, you can imagine Colorado was competing with 49 other states as well as countries. And in that first month and a half, we, we, I remember being on calls with China at one, two in the morning, uh, trying to negotiate shipments into the US in order to meet the needs of our state. So we were really focused on meeting both the rural and urban center, their specific needs. And the work that Denise and Andrew and Janice are doing within Denver, that was really the second part of our work. Once we had things under control in terms of our inventories for the state, we knew that if Colorado was gonna put people back to work, we needed to have PPE available for those businesses. And so we stood up in a matter of seven days, uh, 
uh, with the help of United Way, who is our fiscal agent, the Colorado Health Foundation, which provided a $2 million recoverable grant to cash flow this effort. We opened up a warehouse and uh, opened up a website, connected that to Energize Colorado, which enabled us to meet the needs of those 4,000 PPE kits that the city is now distributing to small business. We've been working with school districts, continue to work with rural providers, whether they be doctor's offices that couldn't get masks or um, medical coats, things that they would need in order to just keep their doors open and meet the needs of their small communities. So we now have a public-private partnership in place that was enabled by the governor. And the good news, you know, when you look at the hospitalizations and uh, the hospital rates, people going into the hospital, Colorado, all things considered, is a relatively good in a good place. And I think the, the governor and the mayor and the leadership across the state gets a lot of credit for doing the right thing. And not always, you know, you, I, I'm sure the governor and the mayor w weren't always sure that the decisions they were making were gonna play out well, and there were certainly critics. But in the end, if you look at where we're at as a state, we're in a good place because of great leadership. So that that's kind of where we are with, with uh, the, the state and my general sense is across Colorado, we're in a fairly good place. People get the PPE that they need. And as it relates to career-wise, uh, you know, like the, all of us, we've watched in the news what was happening around the death of George Floyd. And we thought at career-wise, we've been going through um, DEI training, diversity, equity, and inclusion training for the last year. But it wasn't until we saw what was happening in the streets of this country, did we ask ourselves, and what can we do more? And what we're seeing within CareerWise today with our first graduating cohort is that young people that, Anjanique, I'll use her as an example, she's a student that was in an online school in Aurora, was about to drop out of school. She took on an apprenticeship at Pinnacle Assurance. She just completed her third year and when I asked her how did career-wise affect her view of her future, she said, well, to be honest, before career-wise, I didn't think I had one. But what I've learned is that I have a place at Pinnacle Assurance that I'm helping to contribute to their success and in turn, they're giving me an opportunity I never could have imagined. She was just hired full-time into Pinnacle. She's on her way to get her AS degree paid by Pinnacle and she has a future. And so at CareerWise, we are creating what we're calling Equity First, which is an initiative within our current program that will work with students throughout Denver Public Schools as our first pilot to really put equity first and those companies that want to participate to ensure that they have diversity within their companies, that they are creating opportunity for young people and for their existing workforce so that we do have an equitable economy um, that, that is a way that we're shifting. We're applying $100,000 into a fund that we hope to, Denise, I can maybe need your help, to underwrite the city. Obviously, their budgets are not uh, in a good place right now, but we're, under, we're looking to underwrite the salaries of these apprentices to give them the opportunity to work within key positions in accounting, technology, so forth within the city, um, a way to bring more opportunity. So career-wise, has a real equity push. If any, any of the uh, Tocqueville members that are here would like to be part of the Equity First initiative that we're launching, we would love to, to work with you. Um, this is a great opportunity for us not just to learn about the challenges we have in our communities of color, but actually to do something. So with that, I'll pause. No, no, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. And again, it was, um, I think this, when we all get to the other side of certainly the, the COVID piece of, of things, um, history is going to be a very interesting, this will be a very, very interesting chapter of, of not just the pandemic, but truly the, the important and much needed cultural shifts that are happening and conversations 
that are are happening all at the all at the same um, same time. Uh, Janice and I share a very dear friend um, who said recently there seems to be a disruption in the universe, um, and yet maybe it is a disruption that we all needed. So I'm going to ask um, each of you, um, and, and Andy, if I may start with you, if, what do you think we've learned as, uh, as a community um, in light of, of the last four months that we needed to learn and that we need to keep going as we move as we move forward. And while I give you a second to chat, I do want to invite all of our, our participants. We do have a, a Q&A um, a place that you can put in questions, so please feel free to do that. So, okay, Andy, I bought you 30 seconds to think of your answer. Uh, yeah, you put me on a spot with a big, big question. So what have we learned, I believe, is the question. What have we learned Indeed. through all this? Um, I think one thing that, it, I'm gonna dodge your question a little bit. I think one thing that Denver does really well, just having done business in other markets, I've always felt that Denver is incredibly collaborative. So for example, over the last, you know, I wear different hats. I'm a real estate investor, I'm a real estate developer. I also own a sizable you know, event center and nightclub. I've been on the phone with my competitors over the last three or four mm -hmm. months and we've been sharing notes uh with you know well, what are you doing what are you doing you know and we're like i've literally like the tents that we bought for exto when my competitor saw it i gave them the phone number of the company that we worked with a local company who makes those tents and so now i'm seeing that local company uh sell the tents to other of our competitors across the city because i think what we have learned from all this is the rising tide raises all ships and i know that sounds really trite but that nature of collaboration and rising together is critical because I think what we have experienced is we all fall together. And it's not good if 30% of our restaurants are out of business. That's not good for the 70% of the restaurants that survive. It's not a good thing because that's a lot of service employees. That's a lot of folks who work in those operations that now can no longer patronize the other operations that are survivors. So I just think that the one thing we've learned from this is how critically important it is that we collaborate, but I think that's in uh, Denver's DNA. So that's really positive. Thank you. Denise, what do you think? I think that um, we're all interconnected, is what I've learned. Mm -hmm. um, and we're all human. And the humanness of this event comes front and center every day, all the time. And we're all vulnerable. Um, and some of us are not comfortable in that space, especially as business people, because we have a set set of rules and how we behave and and everything but it's allowed us to be vulnerable and human in this space and realize we are interconnected um we all have you know child care issues we all have financial issues we all have education issues and equity issues and it's and it's all of us not just a select group so i think that has brought this pandemic has brought that front and center and we've had to address it uh, whether we like it or not, we've had to address it and we have to figure it out. Um, I think this is a time, a great time to figure it out and do it in an unusual way. So that's that's the biggest life lesson I've learned. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Janice. To build on what Denise said, um, I kind of have two mantras that I, um, I think of when I wake up each day. We can live with inside the box or we can get rid of the box. And I think that because of everything that we're faced with um, right now that um, we uh, can be rigid and um, think that there are certain ways we need to do things, but sometimes you need to just take down the walls of the box and figure out that there are many ways to move forward together and that it's best to, to do that, like Andy said, collaboratively. And the other one that really um, gets me up every morning is that everyone's fighting a battle we know nothing about. And so if I'm constantly reminded of the folks that um, may not have food for their children or have lost their job or don't have insurance or um, and had those things and now don't have those things um, on top of, again, um, everything we're dealing with um, on the equity front on every level, uh, just remember remembering that it's easy to judge a person based on what you see each day, but you just don't know what's behind them. And so how do we do proactive listening and asking questions and, and not making assumptions and um, whatnot? 
patience is so important right now and um and we get impatient and we get scared and so it's a really a timely um opportunity to build that muscle memory around asking what people are going through and giving um giving a lot more than we normally would so thanks christine thank you thanks janice no well, for, first, obviously, I, I agree with what everyone has said. I, I think one, one of an additional lesson I learned is the power of trust. Uh, mm. So much of what we've been able to do in Colorado was based on trust. When we were faced with a crisis and honestly, whoever I called to help with the effort around PPE, the answer was yes. And then what do you need us to do second? And that lesson I think we can all contemplate, not as it relates to Colorado, because I think we're where we are because we have a great community that has built trust amongst its leadership and its communities. We can always do better. But I'm, I'm honestly deeply concerned because of the work I was doing and seeing what was happening nationally. There's an opportunity for us as a country to look into our soul and decide who are we going to be and are we the United States working together towards common goals? Or are we 50 states working to meet our individual needs? And uh, United Way is, exemplifies working together. And we do live united. You know, the tagline behind your head is so true. And my hope as we look to the future is that the lessons that we're all exhibiting here in Colorado will will become more of a national thing and that United Way is a unique in a unique position because you were you were in all 50 states uh, to create we should all work towards trust this shouldn't be about anything related to politics this is about human life and uh, you know when I was up at two o'clock in the morning in those first few months we were all doing it and there was probably 50 people on our team working on this it's because we knew it was about saving lives and whatever we needed to do, we would do. So I do worry about where we are as a country and, and how we will learn from this because it will be a great study in leadership mm. in terms of how we have addressed this, how other countries have addressed this. And you know, I have great hope for, for where we are as a country and as a state, but I also have real concern because now I don't, I'm not up because I don't think we're gonna have PPE. I'm worried about how we are working with each other and what's happening in the streets and whether or not we really are building equity and opportunity for all of our citizens. And, and I just can't thank you enough, Christine, because United Way is in a position in the next several months, there's gonna be a lot of pain with many Coloradans that won't have the money to put food on the table or a roof over their heads and they're gonna need us and they're gonna need our resources. So I'm just thankful to be a part of United Way in an organization that cares so deeply about its community. No, thank you, thank you. And I think um, the power of, of United Way and the power I think of Colorado is exemplified by the people that are on this panel today. And, and truly it has been the business leaders that have stepped up and brought their their business expertise, their, their innovation, their, their heart and their passion. Um, and I think it is, it is, and I am very proud anytime that I am on a call with other United Way um, colleagues across the country, Colorado is held up all the time and saying, what are your business leaders doing? How is that working with your governor? How is that working um, with the mayor? And I share that same hope, Noel, that that spirit of who we are in Colorado will truly go across the country. And I do think, and you used a really um, uh, important term, is that I do think there's going to be um, some pain in our community going, um, going forward. And that is one of the questions um, that we um, that we received, um, particularly, and perhaps Andy and, and Denise, we have a very particular, you alluded to, to it, we all did, that the winter is coming. Great, great concern about um, particularly small businesses and small restaurants in the winter months to come. So Andy and Denise, and again, Janice, I know you've all been thinking about that, but any thoughts on, any thoughts on that? 
on uh, winter. I know it feels like this is a Game of Thrones uh, episode. Winter is coming um, for the nerds out there. They'll get that joke. Uh, I, I just think that um, one thing I, I would encourage business leaders, I'm, I'm just looking at the roster of who's on the call today. It's a very impressive collection of business leaders. And that's a credit to you, Christine, and your organization for putting together such a great group here today. I, I just think that it's critically important to support small businesses. And, you know, if you're comfortable sitting in a room inside uh, with reasonable distancing, my big ask to the business leaders on this call today or on this Zoom meeting today is um, be willing to go back inside, but we got to change our behavior a little bit. We don't all have to eat dinner at seven o'clock. Okay, I have a toddler. I've been eating dinner at 5.30 for the last year. It works out just fine. So I think we need to think about, you know, spreading ourselves out to support small business. So, you know, eat between five and 10, you know, but, but we cannot, it's not practical for everyone just to have heaters outside. And yes, the winter wonderland will help, but this is not going to help on the level that we need. So I, am gonna, I, I would ask kindly that people wear their masks, consider going back indoors and supporting small businesses, but do it in more of a spread out fashion. And it'll be interesting to see what the governor allows us to do and I you know but uh, that's just one ask that I would have as we go into winter because otherwise I think we're in big trouble. Um, I would add that we're now brainstorming um, to see how we help those retail shops that usually benefit from the holiday season of downtown shoppers and everything so we're looking at maybe a pop-up marketplace uh, Walters Eisenberg's Winter Wonderland um, is a viable idea, but just something, and, and to Andy's point, is to make sure that we all support those small businesses, because keep in mind, for some of them, especially the gift sort of oriented uh, retailers, their biggest season is the holiday season. That's their income. So to be conscious and just, and, and we'll be putting out information, especially with, um, you know, Christine's uh, committee with Fran, uh, with our strategic planning partners, they do a great job of pushing out information. I just would ask everyone to keep, you know, be aware um, and be informed and try to be proactive and be deliberate and intentional and in making sure those retailers, those small businesses where it's a once a year deal that they get um, our support. And I might add, um, in addition to buy local, uh, Christine did a great plug the other day. And don't forget to support your nonprofits. Um, you know, I know my family tradition, I don't need a gift. So I ask for my family to make a contribution to a nonprofit in my name. Um, and so I think that's also something we can do is not forget our nonprofits and how important they are in being in service to community. So um, thanks for reminding us of that, Christine. Thank you, Janice. Noel, what are you thinking about with the winter coming up? Well, we want to make sure that obviously our inventories around at the state level are full. I believe they are. We have contracts for masks with 3M and Honeywell. So mostly it's what everybody's been talking about, um, getting people back to work in a safe manner, keeping our restaurants open, going into stores. I, I love Walter's Winter Wonderland uh, idea. I was in December in Budapest and they have these, these Christmas markets all outside. It's not warm there, so it's okay. And, and they, they were awesome. And that could be a way to keep you know, commerce moving. So I worry more about the families right now. I, there's too many times in the last few weeks where I've seen a mother and a child or a father and a child on the street asking for money. And, and that's a symptom of, and I think it's just the tip of the iceberg. So I worry about the families that are being impacted by this and how we can help. I know one of the questions on the, on the chat is how can we get involved? I think with our resources and our time, whether it's at a food bank, a homeless shelter, uh, this is, that's, who's going to need our help and any person you help is is important it doesn't matter how many as individuals united way enables us to help a lot of people all at once so i just think about how do we meet the needs that are going to happen in the, in the last several months of this year thank you we did have a, a question um and i know many of us have been have been talking um 
about this uh, collectively as well. But again, from from your uh, your individual perspective, and, and Andy, I know you're you're living it actually with with um, a little one. But um, it, the idea of of childcare has become critically even more um, important in allowing our families to go um, back to back to work. So, what are you all thinking about? I know at the the Mile High United Way, our United for Families initiative is all about um, supporting families and childcare and the childcare providers themselves are so, such a critically important component to getting people back back to work. Denise or Andy, um, any thoughts on, on what you've seen from the, on the childcare front? I'll just tell you as a, as, a parent, as a parent of a little girl that does go to daycare, and I, I'm sorry to get political, but I'm not running for anything, so I don't care. Uh, you gotta, you gotta let these kids go back to school. And if there are immunocompromised or daycare, and if there's some immunocompromised teachers or immunocompromised daycare workers, they should stay home. They should still be compensated. But we've gotta let these kids go back to school. I know there's some risk involved with that, but as a business owner, you gotta think about risk versus reward. And it is crippling to these families uh, who cannot take care of their children at home because they need to be at work. And it's even cri more crippling to the children because they need the socialization. And in many cases, they need the food, as Noel's talking about. You know, we have children in the street begging for money. I mean, what have we come to here as a society? So open the day of schools, open the daycares, and uh, that's my two cents on that. But I, I hope I didn't offend everybody on the call by saying that. So you all just got a great glimpse of what I love about the ERC and who comes to the table and their passion and, and what they believe. Andy, that's classic you and I love it. So, so thank you. Denise, what are you seeing from um, the small business? Front? Actually, we've been brainstorming this and uh, we have a subcommittee of micro businesses. Um, and one of the things we've seen coming up organically is a co-op uh, sort of model for childcare, where business owners, uh, if they open their shops like on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they co-op with another business owner, a couple of business owners. They'll take care of their kids Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and we're also seeing it in neighborhoods, a couple of things where we're in neighborhood, you know, because for the most part, um, you know, this burden is a, a female burden. It just is. And we're finding that they're having a conversation of, you know, um, I don't know if I want to take the chance of sending my child back to school, but at the same time, I have to maintain my job or my business. So in a neighborhood of a block, um, you know, all the moms will get together and figure out daycare for each other's kids. So we're seeing that just sort of happen organically and we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we make that work? Um, because you, we're dependent upon decisions they have no control over. The school superintendent, the school system is going to determine when my kids go back to school. That's, it is what it is. But I have to maintain my job and keep food on the table and pay my rent. So how do I do that? They're in sort of triage all the time. Um, and they just they don't have the time to think about the politics of it. They just have to think about the reality of it. So we're seeing that and we're trying to figure out as the micro business and the small and medium sized business, how do we help them, support them? What can we do to do things like maybe up, open up parks and rep centers for those cooperative groups or have the library open for them to use the computers if they don't have internet access. When we have what 12 to 15% of DPS kids don't have internet access. So, um, so those are all kind of new ideas. That's what I mean by thinking out of the box, or as Janice said, you know, get rid of the box. Um, we're sort of getting rid of the box and trying to figure that out, actually. Can I make just one more comment, too? And I think we have a lot of large employers on this call today. Why do we work from nine to five? This isn't 1900s in a Ford factory. We can, if you're a large employer, change your hours, give your employees flexibility so that you know, if folks aren't comfortable sending their kids to daycare, but still have to work, shift their hours around so that they can, you know, be there for their kids at some hours, maybe shift to other hours. There's got to be a way to figure this out because I think the fact that we all work from nine to five really is crippling for so many reasons. Um, that's just something I would encourage large employers to think about because we could really take care of our kids if we didn't have to work from nine to five. 
And again, I think you are all getting a glimpse of, of what these conversations have been like. So innovative, so, so creative. And at the Mile High United Way, again, um, early child care and education has been in the stake in the ground for, um, for us. And as Denise knows well, child care providers are small businesses. And so how do we keep, we have a lights on, keep the lights on fund for child care. Um, providers. It's going to become even more um, critically um, important. We have one question from, um, from the audience, and Noel, maybe I'll start with you and then go to, to Janice. As we've heard a lot of bad news this morning, challenges, but also lots of hope and stories of, of perseverance. Um, Noel, what are you feeling about the future of our business, social service, and cultural sectors? Do you feel um, optimistic and again what do we all need to do to help our critical sectors which is all of our community um, really survive well I, I am optimistic in in part because Colorado started in a very good place in terms of our economy to begin with uh, I think second it has a cohesive business community that really supports and cares about not just its bottom line, but the overall bottom line, which is the communities in which we do business. So I think in general, we're in a good place and we can set an example as we tend to for the country about what that looks like. Um, that being said, there still will be a scarcity of resources um, that will be necessary to support businesses. You know, Energize Colorado has a business loan fund for small business where the PPP loans ended, this is being created. So there, there are options that we can engage with, but I, I think we just keep, have to be really nimble and pay attention to what's happening around us and then respond uh, to the needs of our community. And for those that are voiceless, uh, we need to be their voices. Thank you, Noel. Janice. Thank you. I think our creative economy is also what's helping us get through the pandemic. Um, we're all going to look back, uh, you know, in the future and say we watched these shows, these musicals, um, we enjoyed the symphony in the background as we were working from home. Um, we found all sorts of projects that we could do with our children to keep them feeling connected and um, and continue to be stimulated. And I would say that we're going to be part of the healing process as well. So as we come back up and public health orders lift over time, I think the community will crave being back together. Um, that's one of the things I love about living in Colorado is um, that we have SCFD, you know, we collect $60 million a year to fund 300 arts and culture organizations in the seven county metro area. That's because we believe in investing in a strong um, creative economy and we employ a lot of creatives in our community. So I would just say that that we're here to help people stay connected and find joy um, when we're apart. And we look forward to being the places that you want to come back together to celebrate community when we're through the pandemic. So thank you. Thank you, Janice. Okay, Denise, and then Andy, you'll bring us home. What are you optimistic about? Uh, I'm just going to say this because Denise and I have a bi local call in one minute for ER. Okay. <laughs> okay. My optimistic is that I think that everyone, I'm, I'm hopeful that everyone's going to understand how critically important it is to support your local businesses and, just, and to buy locally. So that's where I'm going to leave this on a level of optimism. Denise? Um, I'm hopeful in the human spirit and just our ingenuity and our dedication and our focus. Um, I'm really hopeful that people really do believe in us, um, as Noel said, as United States. That's, that's my hope. I cannot tell you how grateful I am, um, Noel, Janice, um, Andy, and Denise, the fact that you would spend the morning with us. Again, I, am, I have always said I have had the best job in Colorado because this is the company that I am privileged to keep every um, single day. I can say on behalf of all of Colorado, um, it is your leadership that is leading us through. Um, 
I, again, get to see it every day. I could not be more grateful for what you do for our community and for, for taking the time. You all answered yes to me in 15 seconds when I sent you a note and said, would you talk to our Tocqueville members, please? So truly on behalf of all of Mile High United Way, on behalf of our amazing um, chairman, um, uh, thank you for, for joining us um, this morning. And we know, uh, so go buy local. We know you have a report. I know I'll see you all on our call on, on Wednesday. And um, again, I just can't thank you all, all enough for, for joining us. And for the rest of our Tocqueville members, we are so excited to move into our Community Champions Award to um, invite you to please stay on as you see some other amazing business leaders. But again, Noel, Janice, um, Andy, and, and Denise, just from the bottom of my heart, thank you, friends. Christine, thank we you. love you. You're the best. Thank you. Thank you all. Take good care. You too. Thank you. So I am so very um, excited. So this is a very big week for Mile High. Um, United Way as we move into our um, corporate um, summit week where we work with so many of you and your companies in what we just saw of keeping our community strong. Every year we are so very privileged to present our community champion awards and typically we do this in in a big ceremony where we're all together whether it's in our in our wonderful lobby that I only wish I were in it looks like I'm I'm in um, but um, we are going to do it virtually but I do hope that you all know it does not even though we are together um, and not together um, these are the biggest awards that Mile High United Way can present, and it's truly what they are. You are our community champions. You are our champion of, our, of hope, Lockton, our spirit of hope, Denver Broncos. You have been an incredible partner in service, Spectra, Vectra Bank. Um, Cigna, the social impact that you have made and are making, and then on a very personal level, uh, level Ben Eisenberg, you, you truly are our MVP. So it is really my honor this morning to present our Community um, Champion um, Award. So as I present these virtually, and we look forward to when we can really do this um, in person, um, I'm going, we're going to have, we're going to, by the magic of Zoom, um, zoom in our um, our award winners and our, our partners to, to join me. And um, I have been told to say, and when you zoom in, please smile for one second at the camera because we're going to take a quick picture, which is how we would do this normally. So let's get started with, with our first award, which is the Champion of Hope Award. And it is really my pleasure um, to present this morning the Champion of Hope Award, which is truly the highest tribute um, we can give um, in terms of corporate community involvement um, for all the work we do and in a workplace um, campaign. And I have to tell you, it is an honor to give it to Lockton um, this year, who has always um, been our champion and our partner. But this year in particular, when we needed you, um, when we needed you by our, our side, um, Locked in this year raised over $1 million through their um, successful employee giving campaign in their golf tournament. And if you have never been to a locked in employee campaign, Abby Kemp, there's nothing like it um, in the world. This year's theme was, was camping. Who knew that we actually probably would need to know how to, to do that? But in the past, it has been homecoming in honor of our young people in bridging um, the gap. The year before, it was the, the Olympics. And Abby Kemp, um, who has led the Locked In campaign, um, resulting in the amazing, um, amazing investments that you've made in our community. And again, when the world changed in front of us, Locked In was one of the very first companies to call with a gift to not only to Mile High United Way, but to the, the um, uh, Valley of the Sun United Way in um, Phoenix to support the COVID um, efforts. Lockton has amazing community um, and corporate leaders, including Mark Bundy, Tate McCoy, and of course, Jason Maples, who is on our board of, of trustees, Tocqueville members, 
Um, and last year, Steve locked in with an amazing gift to the United Way, join United Way's million dollar roundtable by investing cumulatively over a million dollars in our work. Abby, I know Abby Kemp is on the, the phone um, today representing Lockton and Abby Week on behalf of Mile High United Way and our whole community, we could not be more proud than to present to you the Champion of Hope Award. I'll give you a second because I think Abby, you're on the phone. Well, I know, I feel like the Academy Awards on behalf of Lockton and on behalf of Jason Maples and, and Abby Kemp, congratulations again to Lockton and our this year's Champion of Hope Award winner. And just thank you, Lockton. Much more work to be done and we couldn't be more proud to have you by, by our side. The next award that we are so proud um, to present is, is I think, um, I think, Allie, this award was, was truly designed for you because as we as Coloradans know, there is no one better um, in terms of spirit. And so we are so incredibly proud to present um, uh, this year for a brand, new, a brand new partnership, the Spirit of Hope Award, which is the highest tribute for a, for a corporate partnership um, that has brought so much to our community. And this year, um, the Denver Broncos have um, kept our spirits alive, but have done so much for, for our community. And in the past two years, we have been so proud to be your partner in our, in our annual Denver Day of Service. And then, of course, our back to school um, bashes. At Denver Day of Service, um, in one day, there were nearly 500 um, volunteers all put together by the, the Denver Broncos gathered at, at 20 different projects and um, provided so much in those projects back to our community. And then of course, our back to school bash that I was privileged to be at um, last, uh, just last, sat two Saturdays ago, where the Broncos provided over 500 um, newly packed, um, full of wonderful, important, um, new supplies of backpacks. Um, so our young people, even as, as um, Ali, as you said, even if you're going back to school virtually, to have a new backpack with, a, with new supplies means the world. We are so grateful um, to Ali Angleken, who is joining us um, today to, to accept um, this award. So on behalf of all of us at Mile High United Way, um, um, Ali, thank you. Thank the Denver Broncos. It is really our pleasure to um, present to you the Spirit of Hope Award. Thank you so much, Christine, and thank you to the entire Mile High United Way team who makes all of these incredible programs possible. So, well, Ali, you know we'll be cheering our Broncos on no matter what it looks like. Um, Come, come fall and um, again, thank you for by, uh, being, always being by our side and truly for being the spirit of hope to all of us. Congratulations. Thank you. We are now very proud to present um, the Partner in Service Award to um, Vectra Bank. And I can just tell you from a very personal standpoint, this award, um, you truly, Vectra, are our partners in all things. Not only are we incredibly proud to be a customer, we are just amazingly proud to be your partner in service to your, to your community. And what you all did um, this year with a hands-on um, impact, the fact that you had, um, 87, this number is amazing to me, 87% of your entire staff um, participated in hands-on volunteer um, activities resulting in over 11,000 hours of service to our community. You served and supported over 350 nonprofit um, organizations. You did toy drives and literacy kits and provided tickets to families who would never have a chance to go to the to the zoo um, and uh, or to um, uh, or to the botanic gardens to see the the festival of of lights and you made sure that our young people in bridging the gap um, had 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 really special 
um, a holiday season together as a, as a family. And then of course, Bruce Alexander, you made me a, a media star and a commercial star um, this year. And um, our partnership personally goes back many, many years. Um, and we are so grateful also to have Todd Munson, who serves on our board of trustees. So on behalf of Mile High United Way, it is really an honor to present the Partner in Service Award to Bruce Alexander and Vectra, Vectra Bank. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, what a true honor to be uh, recognized in this way. And we love our partnership with you and uh, we look forward to doing many things in years to come. So thank you so, thank you so much, Bruce. And again, thanks for making me a, a media star as, as well. <laughs> so our, our next award that we are so proud um, to present is our Social Impact Award to Cigna. And this is so, I love when the awards line up with the values of a company as we've seen all morning. And the Social Impact Award recognizes a corporate partner that truly has embraced corporate social responsibility as a part of their, their um, core and who engage with the Mile High United Way year round in saying that social impact is is year round and we could not be more proud to present it um this year's award to to cigna and kasha i believe you are on the the phone so akasha even nichi mcleod kasha i will keep practicing that for as long as i can um and as i said this morning you have women of your heart who um who help lead this, this community. And Kasha, to you and to the, the CEO of Cigna, John Robel, who I know this is so much of a part of his core, um, congratulations to Cigna for winning this year's Social Impact Award. Oh, Christine, thank you. Um, thank you to, the, to you and to the team and, and to the board. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to accept this award on behalf of John Robel, of course, and our entire um, Mountain States team. There's 1,600 of us across several states, and um, we're really uh, thrilled and honored to be um, to be sharing and leading our time, talent, and treasure uh, in the communities where we where we live and work. And so, thank you so much for this opportunity. We're really grateful. Great, Kasha. Thank thank you. And again, please thank um, please thank um, your entire entire team because we know it is that that leadership as we've seen all morning that comes from that comes from the top and so we are so grateful to john and and to you um, and again congratulations and then this one is always such a pleasure um, personally for me to um, for me to present because we all all know that it takes all of us in our community to make a difference. Um, but there is always someone who has a heart that represents the best of who we are as a community. And this award, our MVP award is, as, as many of you know who have been with us for a long time, is named after Brian Smith, uh, a friend, someone I have been honored to call a friend since I have been a very, very little girl. And as you all know, we lost Brian um, several years ago and felt that the best way to honor him was to name an award um, uh, in his his honor. And I know, Ben, that Brian is smiling ear to ear um, today because we could not think of of anyone more deserving this year um, than, um, than Ben uh, Eisenberg, our MVP in a in a campaign who brings such your heart, your passion, um, our partnership with, with KPMG over the past few years has, has come to life. And again, when values align um, with, with heart, um, you led the way on KPMG's first um, 
uh, day of service as, as well, how you engage in conversations around diversity and equity. Um, you are a member of our Catalyst um, Society. And ag again, um, Ben, you represent the best of who Colorado is. So on behalf of Mile High United Way, it is really an honor to present to you virtually this morning um, the Brian Smith Award for MVP in a campaign. It's, it's such an honor um, to receive it uh, and the award on, in Brian's name and to work with your team um, day in, day out, and, and really the other folks at KPMG who, who just make me look good. So thanks so much. Congratulations, Ben. I do know that thing about being surrounded by people that make you look really, really good um, because I have been surrounded by people all morning who have made me look um, look great. So to Corey Dieterding, to Chelsea Carver, to Zach, um, and to Wade, and to the entire um, team that made this happen this morning, to our community champion um, awardees, you hold us up in a um, all year round, all the time, but particularly this year when this community, as we've seen all morning, um, needs us more than ever. It's who we are as Colorado when we unite together. We could not do this without our Tocqueville members. We could not do this without our corporate partners. We could not do this without our volunteers. So on behalf of Mile High United Way, um, again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for standing by us. Thank you for living United. And we look forward to virtually seeing you very soon. And with God's grace, seeing you all in person soon. Take good care. Thank you for joining us this morning.